All right, here. Happy Monday, everyone. Fortunate enough to have the day off, so what better to do than let's just make another video. Welcome back to Jesse's Occupational Awareness Show. We're going to be continuing on with our series, TDCJ War Stories, titled today. I hadn't exactly come up with one, so let's just call it Escorting a SIG Inmate. Now, paint a little backstory for you guys. It was very rare for us to be properly staffed at shift turnout with enough numbers to run the building. I don't know what the minimum was that we needed. We had A through F pods, A and B at the time. A and B could be staffed by a picket boss and one floor walker. C through F, we needed a picket boss and at least two on the floor because the security threat levels went up as you go from A through F. So let's just say A, B, C, D, E, F, that's six. Let's just say we need 18 at a minimum from there, plus our supervisors, so forth and so forth. So usually we had just the bare minimum to, to staff us. If we were understaffed, we would have to lock down certain buildings. When I say buildings, I mean pods. Usually we would lock down the lesser security ones, A, B, those types, and concentrate on the higher security ones. We couldn't just pull a boss, a CO, we were boss. You couldn't just pull one from general population, bring them over to SEG because they either hadn't been trained. A lot of times there weren't enough stab vests that we had to wear. You could always tell a SEG boss by the stab vest that we wore. And GP inmates fucking hated when we came in their buildings because they knew we weren't going to stand for bullshit. So it was pretty tough to get us staffed from anyone else in the penitentiary, mainly because of the lack of stab this, training, yada, yada. However, if there were enough of us, if there was an overflow of us, we could easily go to general population property room, met something, anywhere else in the penitentiary. Once you could work SEG, you could work anywhere within the, the facility there. So, one of the things that we would do when we did have an overflow of officers, we would have utility bosses. Utility was also another word for a rover. This was a CO that instead of being assigned to one of the particular pods, would be able to roam around. You could take inmates out on escorts. Uh, you could escort the barber in when the pill nurse was making her rounds. Instead of the CO having to break off from moving the inmates around, you could walk with the pill nurse. They could help with the chow cart, passing out the chow trays. That way, the COs that were working the pods there they could continue on with moving inmates around, putting them in the day room, putting them back in the cells, putting them in the shower. Anything that disrupted the normal operation, it slowed down the movement of the offenders. And we had to get those guys moved in and out of their cells, in the day room, in the showers, back in their cells, child served. So, I'm sorry I'm getting off topic. I'm just talking about the SEG operations. <clears throat> Let's get back on with what we got. In this particular day, it was very rare that I was ever assigned utility. We were usually shorthanded. I don't want to say always, I won't say that word. We were typically shorthanded and had just enough individuals that we could work. When we did have an overflow, normally we were sent to GP to work over there because usually they were short officers. Either somebody had called in, taken a personal day, using the comp time that we got, yada yada. That there was always a shorthand. That there was never a waiting line of COs to be assigned to posts, at least while I was there. I'm pretty sure it's not like that today, uh, especially with COVID. So, on this particular day, I was assigned utility. And to me... Some people didn't like utility. Some, they wanted to be in the buildings with these guys. I liked being a rover because I got to roam around the penitentiary 
You got to see some of the other operations in there. You could take inmates to the chapel and see what it looked like. You could take offenders to the infirmary. You could take them to the barber. Usually the barber came to us, but if you had the privilege of having the utility, we could take them there. So I enjoyed it because you got to move around outside of the pod that you were with, with 84 guys just beating and banging and hollering and making loud noises. <clears throat> On this particular day, I was assigned to utility and I was going to take one of the offenders over to the infirmary. Now, usually we didn't know a whole lot about these guys. We had the paperwork on them where we were going to move them around to the day room or the shower or the outside rec room. One of those, it had some of their basic information there, but it really didn't have a whole lot of info short of their name, age, race, and race was typically white, black, Hispanic. It didn't matter if you were Asian, Native American, Irish, you were white. Africa, a dark tone kind of skin, you were black. Honduras, Haiti, Cuba, Mexico, Bolivia, you were Hispanic. It was just an easy blanket way to classify individuals. So, one of my tasks was to escort this individual over to medical. All right. You're supposed to have two officers to escort an individual per policy for a SIG inmate in the classification level of where this guy was. We were supposed to have two officers, baton in hand, hand on the inmate, ready to move him around. Unfortunately, a lot of times that didn't happen. There's the way things are. There's the way they're supposed to be. Try to get them as close together as you can. Okay. Usually it was the way things are. So we had to get done what we had to get done. This particular situation, I was tasked with escorting this inmate over to medical. I don't know what it was. HIPAA law, of course, couldn't ask about it. Wasn't too concerned to me. It was just another inmate that I was getting ready to move. This guy was the highest threat level that you could get, at least at Styles. He was a level three. He was STG, security threat group, Hispanic type. I'm not sure exactly what threat group he was classified in. Didn't know at the time, didn't care. The guy was a little bit taller than me. I say he's probably around 6'3", 6'4", something of that nature. For extra fun, guy also had a walker. Now, I'm sure there were legitimate reasons that these guys did have walkers. Likewise, I'm pretty sure there were reasons they were not. They could fake the game better than anybody, had nothing else to do but run game and play game. So... If the guy did need a walker, great. If he didn't, he had one, and that's how he got around. So I go to the guy's cell, and usual procedure, pop the slot. Guy passes his clothes to me, pat him down. Okay, good, cool. Bring him out, and I, I looked in the slot, and I could see his walker off in the back. And I asked the guy, hey, is it, that your walker? Hey, man, who the fuck you think it is? He starts yelling at me just right off the bat. Like, okay, I got it. Stupid question, but yada, yada. So guy starts yelling at me. I stand there. He kind of baits on the door a little bit, finishes doing what he's doing, and he leans down and he sticks his hands out front way. Well, we were supposed to cuff them in the back. And I tell the guy, hey, you need to turn around and put your hands back behind you. Hey, man, how the fuck do you think I was supposed to walk in this walker with my hand? He starts yelling at me again. I'm like, all right, this this is going to be a tough one here. Okay. Let the guy get finished with what he's doing. Fine. Great. All right. Stick your hands out the slot. Puts his hands out. Click, click. Pulls his hands back in. Roll, push, reach up, push the button. Picket boss pops the hatch. Roll the door open. At this point, I'm facing the guy's back. He's gone back. Got his walker. Boom. And... Start shambling on forward. Okay. 
we get to the stairs and it takes the dude forever to get down the stairs okay so we're walking down the stairs i got my hand on him helping him out he wasn't an old guy if he was he held his age really well if i had to guess from looking at the guy i'd say 40s 50s okay so we get down to the edge of the stairs and inmates are they're still just beating and banging and hollering especially when this guy came out i didn't know it at the time but apparently he was a somebody so get the guy to the door pop him out we're going through the hallway we get him to medical going back to medical and i don't want to take too much time of getting through the medical procedures we get him back to where he's supposed to go and he's supposed to get x-rayed he's laid back on a bed, whatnot, platform, rack, whatever you want to call it. No pad, just a metal bed. And they're going to run the x-ray over him. And the nurse tells me I need to take the handcuffs off of him so they can run the x-ray through him. And I said, I can't take the hand restraints off this individual. She says, well, I can't run the x-ray with him hand restraint. And I said, she didn't like this at all. I said, well, I guess you're not going to run an x-ray then. And she stares at me, turns, leaves the room, and then it's just me and the inmate. The inmate looks over at me. Hey, boss, uh, I don't think she'd take these handcuffs off me. And I said, yeah, I agree with you. I don't know why he said that. It wasn't menacing. It wasn't evil, just as conversationally as could be. Like, I don't think you should take these handcuffs off me. Cool. I agree with you. All right. So I'm standing there. And at this point, she comes back in and there's an older guy, I'm guessing was a doctor, comes in and says, let's get these handcuffs off him. We need to run the x-ray. I said, sir, I'm not taking the handcuffs off this inmate. This is a level three segregation inmate. This is the highest classification there can be. I'm not taking the hand restraints off. I said, officer take the hand restraints off or you'll be walked out okay walk me out i'm not taking the hand restraints off this guy guy says to me again officer give me the key i'm going to take the handcuffs off this guy i said sir i'm not giving you my key i'm not taking the hand restraints off this individual they're staying on okay i didn't have a radio i couldn't call my supervisor nothing like that the two of them leave the room. Inmate's still laying on the bed, handcuffs in front of him. At this point, my heart rate's elevated, my hands are kind of shaking, just had a verbal altercation with, for somebody, I probably could have lost my job at that point is what I'm thinking. This is, you know, this is some high level medical dude and they're telling me to do this and I'm flat out refusing, okay? At this point, it's been probably five minutes or so this guy and the major comes in major was one rank below the assistant warden on up to the warden they still wore a uniform they had a gold oak leaf on their collars supervisors that i saw were sergeants and lieutenants lieutenant was a shift supervisor sergeant backed them up okay so at this point the major comes in what's going on officer hey major I've uh, been told to take the hand restraints off this individual, and I'm not going to. Well, what classification is he? He's level three segregation. Major kind of stops, looks at the guy. He looks over at the doctor, says, hand restraints aren't coming off him. Well, we can't run the x-ray without it. The hand restraints aren't coming off him. There's no way. Doctor leaves. I'm in there with the major. Major looks at me. What's your name? Officer Carter. Major CO3 Carter. That was a good call. Turns, leaves. It was very rare to get any kind of acknowledgement like that. So the inmates laying there. Was, okay, so, so what the fuck are we supposed to do now? Go back to the house? I, I guess this isn't going to take place today. Again, I don't know what he was there for. I couldn't find out. So, all right, let's 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 go back to the pod. <laughs> Guy sits up, 
turns around, put my hand on him, grab his walker, move his walker over to him. He gets his walker, and we start going on. I'm doing my hands like he's picking up a walker. <laughs> All right. We're going down the hallway. It, once we got back in SIG, it was a long walkway back to where he was. F-Pod, level three. All right. We get about midway, and as I'm walking the guy, he wasn't out of shape. He, he wasn't really muscular, so to speak. It just felt like a normal arm. There, there wasn't a lot of meat to grab onto, and he wasn't muscular. And I noticed it felt like at this point I'm holding on to a baseball bat or a metal pole. It was just as tight as could be. And I looked over at the guy, and his eyes had rolled up in the back of his head. His tongue was kind of sticking out. He was just just tensed up, just as tense, absolute tense as could be. Body was like a telephone pole. All right, and I'm holding the guy, and I said to him, hey, what's going on? And he lets go of the walker and starts to drop. Well, as he's dropping, he's still just as tensed up as can be. I've got my hand on the guy. I reached out and I grabbed him by the shirt and I let him go back down. And as we get going from there, guy starts laying on the ground and starts kind of flopping. He was At that point, I knew he was going into a seizure. If he was an actor, this was the best actor I've ever seen. Guy pissed himself, spit, spittle, foam coming out of his mouth, just flopping around. Now, not like in the movies where they're flopping all over the floor. He's just laying there kind of bouncing around. And I don't remember what my exact words were. I want to say, I think I yelled something out down the hallway. I need a pillow. I wanted to protect the guy's head. I remember as I'm trying to hold on to the guy's arm and I've got my hand up under his head and as he's flopping around, I just remember hearing, here boss. And I turned to the side and a freaking wash rag, it wasn't wet. A wash rag hit me in the side of the face and two individuals in white took off running. I'm saying it like that because I didn't know who it was or what was going on. I was so focused on this guy. I take this rag, I took my hands off the guy, bunched it up as best I could, put it up under his head, and he's still flopping around, still just as tensed up as could be. I guess I had yelled loud enough. So, I'm sorry. What it was, it was two SSI's trustees had come running out of the chow hall. They heard me yell. They come running out of the chow hall, saw that. They weren't going to get involved, but the one had a wash rag with him, threw it at me. That was the best thing they could get to a pillow, and then ran back around. That was as much help as I was going to get out of those guys. By this point, I had made enough noise. The cook, the food service manager, saw what was going on outside. She got on her radio, called for ICS. That's one of the emergency call-outs. Incident command station was the term they used for it. The supervisors come out and started the takeover. By the time Lieutenant Raymond and Sergeant Jones got there, of course it took Sergeant Jones a lot longer to get there than Lieutenant Raymond. The guy had stopped flopping around and had passed out. Now I've got it, my hand up under his head with the rag, my hand still on his arm. Lieutenant Raymond comes over. Car, what, what's going on? I, I, I don't know, LT. I, I, I guess the guy had a seizure. Uh, we're looking over him. And by this point, another radio call had gone out, emergency, medical, standing there with the guy. A couple of nurses came in with a stretcher, helped get the guy loaded up, strapped him down, still had his hand restraints on. They rolled him away, and I, I was standing there with Lieutenant Raymond and Jones, and Jones is covered in sweat, and watching the guy get wheeled away, and I, I remember saying, damn, LT, I took my fucking cuffs away. I don't have any cuffs anymore. Raymond started laughing, fucking slapped me on the arse. All that that just went on, and you worry about some damn handcuffs. 
Man, just go get some from checkout. Go back to doing what you're doing. Roger that, LT. Go back down, get another handcuffs uh, assigned to me. Had to fill out some paperwork with where the other ones had gone to so they could be tracked. And went on about doing the rest of the utility day. You know, just a just a normal day in, in SEG. So, more to that story was other employees within the facility don't work well with security. Security is always going to a clash with medical, with admin. They wanted me to take the restraints off this guy, and there's no telling what he could have been capable of. I don't know if he did or didn't need his walker. He could have been trained in any kind of fighting style. I, I don't know. I just know I wasn't going to take the hand restraints off. The doctor basically threatened with firing me, which he couldn't. I probably would have been fired quicker if I had taken the hand restraints off and this guy went stupid and attacked the doctor, attacked the nurse, doctor, <laughs> attacked the doctor, attacked the nurse, or attacked me. I just know I stood my ground. I wasn't going to. The major had my back without saying too much other than good on you for not taking those off. Guy goes into a seizure. I guess he was going to medical for something that had to do with that. And we worked through it. So I know this was kind of all over the place, pinball bouncing around, but that's how it gets when I get my thoughts going on in some of those situations. I really hope you guys enjoyed this. If you made it all the way to this end, shout out to you. I appreciate you taking the time. If there's anything you guys do want to see, let me know. And next video, we're just going to continue on with more of the war stories. I'll take care of yourselves. Appreciate every single one of you.